I suppose one of the hottest topics culturally is the subject of love. I even had a parishioner one time in a previous parish who said, Father, if you just preach about love, we'll be happy. They don't want to hear anything else except love. We see it expressed in literature, poetry, and art from cultures spanning the range of history. We hear everyone from ministers to laity, politicians, news reporters, Hollywood figures, all expressing their ideas of what love means. And especially since the moral upheaval of the 60s, how love is applied in our life and what exactly we mean by love. We hear such popular slogans as freedom to love. And we hear popular lines from songs, all you need is love which I often like to remind people is not the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but rather the gospel of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. But Jesus himself says, love one another, and people will often reduce everything having to do with faith to that one word. Just think of it. The entire Bible, which if you have a good size Bible, is at least an inch and a half thick. Just throw it out. All you need to know is that one word, which I think is no irony, is a four-letter word. But Jesus does, in fact, reduce everything to that question of love. The entire law can be summed up in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments can be summed up into love God and love your neighbor. And even reduced to the simple phrase, love one another as I have loved you. But we've gone in so many directions with regard to what love means that it is perhaps among the hottest topics today, whereas if you don't have the right attitude with where love is concerned, you could get yourself canceled, at the very least. But how do we as Catholic people understand the biblical connotation of love, and in fact, what Jesus himself said about love? Our late... Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, in one of his encyclicals, entitled, God is Love, Deu Caritas Est, writes heavily about how we understand that command to love and our understanding of how God is love. He's the personification of love. And as such, Jesus became that human personification of love. It's not a very long encyclical compared to, say, the encyclicals of John Paul II. I would highly recommend reading it, as I always highly recommend reading uh, the things that have come out of the church over history and even from our most recent Holy Fathers. But I promise you it's not easy reading. Because when it comes to love, it's interesting, while we tend to think of love very emotionally, there's not much emotional about what Pope Benedict reads or about, about what he writes or about how we approach that understanding of love. But he speaks of how love is spoken of in the Bible, specifically in the Greek Old Testament. Originally, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but eventually it was uh, translated into Greek. And he writes, the Greek Old Testament uses the word eros, which is one of three words that the Bible uses for for love, uses the word eros only twice while the New Testament does not use it at all. Of the three Greek words for love, eros, philia, the love of friendship, and agape, New Testament writers preferred the last, agape, which occurs rather infrequently in Greek usage. As for the term philia, the love of friendship, It is used with added depth of meaning in St. John's Gospel in order to express the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. The tendency to avoid the word eros, together with the new vision of love expressed in the word agape, clearly points to something new and distinct about the Christian understanding of love. Of course, if you just listen to the word eros, It's where we get the word erotic in the English language. I don't think I need to describe in much detail what that means. I'm aware of the age range of the uh, congregation here today. And that is the most common word in Greco-Roman culture used to express the word love as we translate it in English. 
The word philia is the love between friends, the close love between friends. So I hate to break it to you folks, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were not lovers. Samwise Gamgee and Frodo Baggins and the Lord of the Rings were not lovers. They were good, close friends and shared the close love called philia, that is the close love between friends. Not eros, but philia. But finally, agape, which is used most frequently in the scriptures, but less frequently, in fact, the least frequently in Greco-Roman culture, is the love of complete self-giving, as Christ gave himself totally to the will of his Father, gave himself totally for the salvation of the world, and of which he said to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. And it's in that love, agape, that the scriptures speak most frequently. But back to Eros, we can each compare that understanding to how our current society understands love. The Greeks, not unlike other cultures, considered Eros principally as a kind of intoxication, the overpowering of reason, by a divine madness. All other powers in heaven and on earth thus appear secondary. And Virgil himself adds, let us too yield to love. Eros was thus celebrated as divine power, as fellowship with the divine. But the Old Testament firmly opposes this form of religion, which represents a powerful temptation against monotheistic faith combating it as a perversion of religiosity, but it in no way rejected Eros as such. Rather, it declared war on a warped and destructive form of it. Because this counterfeit divinization of Eros actually strips it of its dignity and dehumanizes it. An intoxicated and undisciplined eros, then, is not an ascent in ecstasy. Far from being godliness, godlessness, they were human persons being exploited. An intoxicated and undisciplined eros, then, is not an ascent in ecstasy toward the divine, but a fall, a degradation of man. Evidently, eros needs to be disciplined and purified if it is to provide not just fleeting pleasure, but a certain foretaste of the pinnacle of our existence, of that beatitude for which our whole being yearns. I'm not going to read the entire encyclical, but you can imagine it gets very detailed into the understanding of love as it's expressed biblically. But we can certainly relate from his words how our society is caught up in that understanding of love even to the point of people of a Christian faith yielding to that approach and philosophy behind love. But it is not completely excluded from our Catholic understanding because the love between a husband and wife, the consummation of that love, fulfills the human dignity of Eros while at the same time expressing that agape of giving a complete giving of oneself for the other in that love relationship between a husband and a wife. But when we see how we are to understand even eros, when we see how infrequently that word is used only twice in the entire Bible and in the Old Testament, and how frequently we hear and read the rarest expression, the rarest used word in Greco-Roman culture for love, let me reiterate that. The most common word is the least used word in the Bible, and the most common word in the Bible is the least used word in Greco-Roman culture, tells us something that ultimately is at the heart of our approach to love as a Catholic people. That our understanding of love has always been, must always be, inevitably, without avoidance, counter-cultural. Our understanding of love must always be countercultural, And it personifies the words of Jesus when he says, I have put you into the world, but you are not of the world. The world will oppose you and the world will hate you because we are so countercultural in our approach to so many things, but especially in this understanding of love. And when we see that 
expression of God being the very personification of love, we see that God's love in loving us is in giving of his only Son, who gave himself totally to his Father, who gave himself totally out of love for his people and his church by his death on the cross. And it is in that vein that Jesus says, Love one another as I have loved you. What a counter to what I like to call the glandular paganism that we see today, where love is reduced to a biological function, a measure of pleasure in how we obtain it. But our understanding of love is, in fact, countercultural in all areas of historical expression of love. And we as a people of faith must always be that expression of the love that God has given in giving us his son, that his son has given in offering himself totally in obedience to God and the salvation of the world. God is love. And in imitating Jesus, he gives us conditions for that love. Very simple in today's gospel. You live in my love if you do what I command you. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. There's that agape love again. You are my friends if you do what I command you. There is no love for us as a people of faith if it does not begin and end with complete obedience to God and his commands. Let us pray that as we express that love, let us pray that as we celebrate that love of our Heavenly Father, that we will come to a deeper and more substantial understanding of what exactly is that love we are called to live. And pray to God that we will have the courage to express a love that is countercultural to the world we see around us. And ultimately, we will fulfill and obey the command that Jesus gives us in fulfilling his commands and living in his love, in loving one another as Christ has loved us and expressing the will of his heavenly Father, that all-encompassing presence of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a God that is, at its heart, the full manifestation of love.